university. <coughs> I have uh, so many fond memories here. Uh, when Professor Archman invited me to give a talk, I was thinking about this. Uh, by training, I'm a cosmologist. I have done very little work uh, on planetary sciences. In fact, two or three papers. Uh, then I started thinking about IFS and its mission, uh, the new mission, and all these things. Then all of a sudden, it came to me that I should give a talk uh, on this fascinating field uh, that is about uh, our great ambition to find uh, a planet uh, with life going around another star. Um, so as uh, Professor Lakshman said, my journey started from Germany and from the IFS. So I have these two great men. I remember, uh, in fact, he is now a good friend of mine, Chandra Vikram Singh, by 1991, he met in Africa. Um, so in a, uh, in a dinner conversation, rather, we were talking about life. And he said, Jose, isn't it obvious to you that the universe is teeming with life? Uh, that was a very, very optimistic viewpoint. And in fact, he has this viewpoint. Now I do have the same viewpoint. Um, and he did an optimist, as you can gather. Um, but uh, several years prior to this, in 1988, here at IFS, I met uh, Professor Pernam Perron. And we had dinner together. And we were talking about life elsewhere. And then he had to say, uh, we have all the ingredients here on the Earth, so why do we have to think about the rest of the universe? So, as you see, this is more like a, a cosmic viewpoint, and this is more like an anthropocentric viewpoint. So now, um, I ask you to judge, at the end of this talk, where we stand uh, with uh, our ambition to find life elsewhere. So it is very clear that for thousands of years, uh, people have been asking one fundamental question, that is, uh, whether we are alone in the universe. Now, the astronomers, today, uh, we have lots of capabilities. There are lots of smart people, and uh, cheap electronics, and so many technical uh, advancements, and so many other things. Uh, now, we want to understand, we want to answer this question, but this time, uh, quantitatively. We want to understand, we want to measure how many Earths are there and how many plants are there um, that can harbor life. And those are the things. So my answer, and in fact, uh, the astronomical community now is pretty much agreeing that our answer is pretty much hinting at big no, we are not alone in the universe, as you'll probably figure out very soon. OK, but this is a very ambitious thing. The planet finding is a very interesting. But it is exceedingly difficult. Uh, but I take this viewpoint. I think we are now poised to for another uh, Copernican type revolution. That is, uh, we are going to figure out, I think, uh, sooner than later, that we are living in a universe uh, in which uh, the biological life is there. In fact, we are going to figure out pretty soon. In my uh, my view, uh, we are living in a biological universe. So what we are trying to do is a very, very difficult thing. Now here is a star, in fact this is the sun. Uh, now here is a planet. Uh, we know that come back to the sun, the planet, uh, our planet, our home is very, very small. It is almost like a speck of dust. So we are trying to figure out a speck of dust going around another star light years away. Uh, and in fact it is very, very difficult. So we cannot use uh, a day-to-day -day telescope, a small telescope. Uh, that's why the planet finding is, is very, very expensive. And we need to use uh, a telescope like this. This is a great place in the Atacama Desert, in a place called Parano. I myself have been there. This is the Pacific Ocean. You might think that because of the ocean, uh, this is a bad place for an observatory. But it turns out that this is the driest place on Earth. Uh, somebody told me that it hasn't rained uh, in the Atacama Desert for uh, this area for about 2,000 years. Maybe I'm wrong. Um, you can tell me later if I'm wrong. But anyway, there is nothing over here. The atmosphere over at the Gamma Desert is extremely uh, stable. Uh, and in fact, these telescopes are producing uh, crisp uh, images of the night sky. Or we have used a telescope like this. In fact, this is a, a, a 
very nice telescope now it is in orbit called Kepler it is looking at the constellation of Cygnus uh, choosing a very very small patch just looking at it and it has a tremendous capability to find the planets particularly the planets like the Earth going around the other stars as you will see okay so now if you look at the universe a little bit uh, very quickly uh, here is a real astronomical image um, there are lots of the stars over here and here is one of the stars it is a massive star let's say it's about the mass is about 10 times the mass of the sun or so uh, we now know uh, pretty precisely what is happening in such a star because our understanding in physics is very complex uh, now uh, we can show mathematically that such a star becomes pretty unstable after a few millions of years or so just before that if you look at the central region right here, the central region is pretty much like uh, like an onion. It has shells. The first shell is hydrogen. Hydrogen is burning to produce helium and so on. These are the chemical elements that we have seen in the periodic table in your high school. But this star becomes very unstable. Then we can show that it, it uh, collapses, so it implodes with a speed comparable to half the speed of light or so, and then bounces back, exploring the whole thing like this probably wiping up the whole thing around here. So if you happen to be uh, in a planet like this, next to a star, it's quite a bad story when a supernova happens. But there's a good side to this. The good side to this is that, if you look at this, all these chemical elements now are in this gas cloud. Now here is such a gas cloud. This is a real picture, all of the, the real pictures. And here is, uh, here is a, a real supernova ha happening. Now the nice thing is that if you imagine a neighborhood like this, such an explosion happens. Now this uh, area is now completely enriched with chemical elements. Now uh, due to certain mathematical reasons, uh, some of these pockets can collapse under its own gravity to form the other stars. We now know that this happened in our neighborhood uh, about five million years ago. That's called the solar nebula. Uh, we have a pretty good understanding about this. So the nebula became unstable and it collapsed and became kind of a red dwarf and then, then evolving, evolving like this and we are right over here and this is nothing but the journey of our sun. The sun came into existence about 5 billion years ago, now it is middle aged, so after 5 billion years ago, after or so, the sun becomes a red giant, it is a huge star uh, and then what will happen to the earth, we can talk about that later. Uh, then for some reason, the sun is going to get rid of all this gas over here and the central engine will be visible to the other astronomers and somewhere else in, somewhere in, in the universe. So very quickly, this is something that we have learned in 10,000 years or so. Um, now the question is, uh, can we find the, 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 the planets going around uh, such stars or around massive stars? Uh, just to fix our ideas, it is possible. This is a real picture taken by Hubble Space Telescope. And here is a star. The astronomers know how to block this light. They have blocked this light. Now you can see these objects. These are real observations made in 2008. Now, in fact, the Hubble Space Telescope was able to find uh, some of these great molecules, uh, carbon, oxygen, and sodium, and few other things on some of these planets. And we are going to find out how they were able to do that. So it's possible to take direct images, but this is a very challenging thing. Now the next question is, planets are, whether are they really common? Is it now impossible to argue that the planets are not so common? Now 10 years back, you could have argued that planets are not so common. But now we have different techniques, we have big telescope, satellites, uh, uh, images, and so many things that uh, to argue that the, the planets are very common. Uh, it is also true by looking at uh, quite a lot of data that uh, the Earth-like planets right, uh, are becoming pretty common as well. Now, in, uh, the first detection came in 1995. Uh, there is a rough definition. Um, I don't know whether this definition is really correct or not, but this is what I have read, that the mass of a planet, if it is less than 13 Jupiter masses or so, we refer to this as uh, a planet an exoplanet or planet going around another star but the first detection in 1995 was a hot jupiter now what is a hot jupiter hot jupiter is nothing but 
uh, nothing like it. It is very similar to our Jupiter, but we know that Jupiter is very far away from the Sun. For some reason, uh, such a big planet can come pretty close to the Sun, like a terrestrial planet, right, like the Earth, uh, distance or so. If that happens, we refer to that object as a hot Jupiter. In fact, the planets can migrate, but that, that's a, uh, a different topic. We can talk about that later. So by 1970s or so, the astronomers had figured that the stars do have these disks. And these are called protoplanetary disks. So if you can observe, or if you can detect such a disk, because the sun has such a disk, then there is a very clear evidence, there is very clear evidence that the planets could exist. Sun, the sun has a, such a belt, which is called the Kuiper belt, and it extends from 30 to 50 astronomical units. The astronomical unit is nothing but the average distance between the, the sun and the earth. Uh, so it is far, but anyway, uh, there is a belt like this. These are some objects in that belt. Uh, so we are detecting such things, not these objects, but the gas clouds around certain stars, the Zubokan program predicts. That, that's how we know that the uh, uh, early astronomers came into, uh, came into the conclusion that uh, they could be planets. So how do we detect them? Uh, this is this is the subject in fact. The astronomers use some very good methods. Now one of the methods um, is called the radio via radial speed. What we are going to do is to measure the Doppler effect. Um, yeah, our observational techniques have become pretty good that we can now measure to this accuracy. That is one kilometers per second. This is a remarkable uh, achievement in astronomy because there is such a such a very small speed, a celestial speed, uh, we can we can really do that. So our imagination is this, let's say there is a star over here and here is a tiny little dot, the exoplanets going around this star. Now if you are looking in this direction, you see that here is a center of mass and you learn in your high school that when two things um, are rotating about each other, they got to do about that common center of mass. So therefore, this star is now going back and forth uh, with a very small speed, about <coughs> one kilometer a second or so, the worst case, uh, that we can detect. By looking at that, we can deduce so many things. Right. So how do we do this? Now here's the planet. If it is coming towards you, just like a train coming towards you with a whistle on, uh, you hear a low pitch, a high pitch. If, if the train is going away, you hear a red, red pitch. That's called the Doppler effect. But when you look at a star, um, the stars do have these dark lines. These are called the spectral lines. So these lines can be shifted to blue or red if a star coming toward you. The blue shift, now we can measure that little shift. And by doing this, we can use the orbital speed of this guy. Right. But I, I want you to think about this as well briefly. Now here is the situation for a star. But here is a situation for many stars. You see this, that these dark lines do differ. For this star and this star, you see that they are at different locations. Right? We'll talk about this later. In fact, this is almost like a fingerprint. If you know this spectrum, then we know everything about the star. So now, let's say we obtain the spectrum. Once we obtain the spectrum, the astronomers know how to say many things about this star. In fact, uh, if it is a normal star, we refer to this as a main system star. By looking at the spectrum, we can figure out the star mass. Now, if you know a little bit about neutronian mechanics, um, if you observe this, what you deduce is nothing but the summation of the mass. So then, we know the sum of the masses. We know the mass of the star from the spectrum. Some minus that will give you the planet mass. So in fact, we can really calculate the planetary masses this way to uh, a remarkable accuracy. Now, imagine that you are an alien astronomer, and suppose you want to observe the Jupiters, and if you look at the sun, it is really a bad place. Why? Because the sun has only one Jupiter, and sun has so many other small stars. So then, Let's say you, if you want to look at the rocky planets like the Earth, Venus, or Mars, or Mercury, and then we need to look at what type of stars? We need to look at these low mass stars. 
right? They're called M stars. Do you know a little bit of astronomy? The sun is a G-type star. Uh, now, M-type star is a cooler star. It is a smaller star. And we have observed so many M stars in the sky. And now our, our understanding is that one in every 50 uh, such stars have a giant. So the giants are very, very uncommon. The giants go around young blue stars, massive bigger stars, but not about small stars. So if you want to detect a Jupiter, then you want to look at a bright star. How do you pick out a bright star? You go out at night, look at the sky, you will see very bright stars. They, these are in fact bright stars, big stars. But the number of fainter stars is quite large. There are so many uh, M-type stars or fainter stars. So if you want to detect the Earth, then you want to look at an M-type star, a smaller star. So now, if you're curious about some of these pictures, these pictures are not really real, um, but we have a pretty good understanding about this. Uh, we're going to talk about this Kepler spacecraft a little more later. Uh, now, here is an object that has been detected by this Kepler satellite. It is pretty much similar to Venus. Uh, and there is another object over here, Kepler 20 f It is pretty much like this. So Kepler is now able to detect certain planets, which are pretty similar to the terrestrial planets, not the gas giants. Right? We have uh, Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars. These are like Earth-like planets. That's why they are called terrestrial planets. The other ones are called Jovian planets because they are more like Jupiter's. So then, um, I did skip two other things, to do. I think we can come back to that later. Uh, now, there is another method which is becoming very popular, um, that is called the detection via transits. So, what is the theory over here? Uh, this is quite remarkable, at that. <laughs> even to me. Uh, if a planet goes just in front of a star, then it turns out that the starlight is dimmed a little bit. There was an event just like this uh, a few weeks back. Our planet Venus um, went in front of the sun. And some of my students took even pictures. And this was done by early astronomers in 1700s. So it's possible to do it in solar system. Now the astronomers can do the same thing for the other, other systems. Okay. Now to do that, these yeah, small m dwarfs are ideal. Why? Because if the star is big, if you imagine a, a planet, then this planet is going to take a pretty long time to go from one side to the other of the, the star. But if you imagine a smaller star, then this transit time, which is here is the object, now the planet is going around it, the transit time is going to be small. Suppose we can do this, then what we, are, we can obtain what is known as a light curve. By, by looking at the light curve, we can figure out the size, diameter, orbital speed, and mass of such planets. Okay. Once we do that, we have the mass and the diameter, then we can figure out the average density. That's how we can figure out whether this uh, planet is a rocky planet or a gas planet. This is exactly what we do in the case of the solar system. If you know the mass and the volume, and then we can figure out the density, that's how we know that there should be metals inside or gases inside in a particular planet. The good thing about this method is that uh, the transit time is very small, so we can really measure the things. And in fact, this method is becoming very, very popular among the, the astronomers. Why? Because we can look at these M stars, because systematically we have to take the M stars. We know that Earth-like planets do go around uh, M stars or G stars or smaller stars. So therefore, if you're looking for Earth, and if you're trying to detect light on such a planet, then this is the method to go about. So a little bit about this transit method. This transit method is pretty famous, and uh, we are spending quite a lot of money on this. And one of the famous spacecraft is this. This is a Kepler spacecraft, and it is looking at the Milky Way. And here's the Cygnus area. This is a very, very small area, and this is the size. So we are looking at a pretty small patch um, constantly. The telescope is not moving. Now what is quite remarkable about this is that the telescope can analyze 170,000 stars at any given time. One shot, 170,000 stars. It's a remarkable achievement of astronomy. Now, 
Here is the case. The planet now goes just in front of the star. So the starlight will be cut a little bit. So if you look at this plot, which is the intensity of starlight as a function of time, when the planet is just in front of it, you should, we will get a little dip like this, and then it continues, and then the whole thing repeats. If there is a planet, it's going to repeat. Let's look at the real observations. If you have a big telescope, in fact, this was done by a Dante's uh, uh, telescope, uh, I think, in Chile. Uh, now, here is the observation, but you see that this is very messy because of our own atmosphere. But Kepler is in all this. There is no atmosphere. Now, see that the data is very, very clean, happening at the same time. Now, we exactly know that this is a planet going around some other star. Now, as I told you, the Kepler can detect, uh, Kepler can analyze about 170,000 stars at any, any given time. Uh, this is a tremendous thing. So by looking at the data, right, uh, thousands of bytes of data, uh, we have been able to figure out that there are about 2,000 planets, right? So far, every day, the number of planets is increasing. And in fact, out of this 2,000, uh, when I was preparing this talk, I found out that uh, more than 1,900 uh, and so, so discovered so far are uh, smaller than Neptune. This is a very promising thing because now we are detecting many, many small planets like the Earth. Okay. Now, we also have very clear evidence that some of these planets are in the habitable zones of respect to stars. Now, what is a habitable zone? Now, it happens that Earth is in the habitable zone of the Sun. Now, if you look at the solar system, the Sun is there and then uh, as we go away from the sun, the temperature is decreasing, and in fact, there is a certain region. If you happen to be, if your planet happens to be in that region, then on that planet, the water can exist in a liquid form. So it's a theoretical boundary, not very precisely uh, defined. So you can simply assume that uh, the habitable zone is a zone in which the water can exist in a liquid form. Now we'll come back to this later. And now, what about the direct uh, uh, detection? That is also possible, but not always a little difficult and incredibly expensive. By 2008, uh, people had done a uh, few of these things. Um, there are certain pictures. Uh, now, here is the star. The star has been cut. Now, uh, uh, there is a planet over here. There is a planet over here. There is a planet over here. You notice one thing that uh, this is referred to as something a, something B, something C, and so on. Star name plus A. Because the astronomers now think that we should not name the exoplanets because the people or the creatures living in these exoplanets could have better names for them. Okay, that's the reason. Now, apart from this, there is another method that is becoming pretty popular. That is for the detection via accurate astrometry. Now remember, this is the same diagram. So in the early days, we were looking like this, and we were looking at this wobble. The star is coming toward us or going away, so we can detect this motion to the Doppler shift. But this time, we are going to look at the situation like this. So here is a common center of mass. The star is now wobbling. Now here is the unseen planet. But now, we can measure the, the position of this star very precisely. That is called the, the detection via accurate astrometry. By 2002, Hubble Space Telescope uh, was able to do some of these measurements. Um, unfortunately, um, because of the, the, the detection limits, we can detect only Jupiter-sized masses because uh, we need to have a bigger gravitational tug on the, the star to displace the star in the lateral direction. So that's why we are systematically detecting only Jupiter mass exoplanets using this method but not the smaller ones. Now here is another method um, that uh, I myself participated a little bit. Uh, this is called the gravitational uh, microlensing effect. Um, it's a very beautiful effect uh, predicted by uh, Einstein. Uh, so the theory is very small, uh, very simple. Now here is a mass object. It's called a lens. It can be a star or anything. Now here is a more remote object and general relativity predicts that a light ray can travel like this and travel like this, producing multiple images. Uh, this, this is a real observation. Gravitational lensing effect really exists. But if 
this is a star and this is a star, then the bending angle is very, very small. You are not going to uh, resolve these objects, so the result will be a, a simple curve like this with one time magnification only. In fact, this was predicted by my thesis advisor, Gordon Kaczynski. Uh, so according to this calculation, uh, let's say we have a we have a pretty nice alignment. You are over here, here is a here is a remote star, and here is a nearby star, right? When the things are perfectly aligned, we will get a light magnification, then after a few days, it decays, right? Never to happen again. But the nice thing about this is that suppose um, this star is a small star like an M star. Now it is entirely possible that there could be planets. So now the light comes in and uh, when it travels near this, it detects this star plus the other planets. So therefore, we are not going to get this kind of magnification, but we are going to get these wiggles that can be uh, modeled very nicely using the equations in gravitational lensing theory. Uh, then we can extract the masses of the such planets. And the nice thing is that uh, we are more likely to detect Earth-like planets in this scenario, but not the bigger ones. But unfortunately, the probability for such a, uh, such a thing, like perfect alignment, is very, very small. Uh, but there are certain searches, and we have been able to find about 10 planets going around the other things uh, by this method. <coughs> So what about the life uh, on the other uh, planets? Now here is an estimate that I have done. Uh, let's say we are looking, we are going to look at the all the stars in the Milky Way. We can count the number of stars in the Milky Way that comes out to be about 400 billion stars or so. Uh, now given the probability that we know of, uh, it is easy to find that there should be about 25 million planets like the Earth in the Milky Way alone. But unfortunately, uh, up to today, um, we are detecting only Jupiter-sized planets because our detection limits, right? That has nothing to do with the, uh, the actual uh, uh, population. This is a selection effect uh, as far as we understand. Now, if you look at a little bit about uh, the, the life on exoplanets, um, Many years ago, people thought that space is kind of devoid of many things. But that is not what we are uh, discovering. The space is filled with various gases, uh, various organic molecules, and these are nothing but the necessary ingredients of life. And there are now we are, uh, we are discovering so many planets going around the other stars, especially using Kepler spacecraft. Some are Earth-like planets, some are the habitable zones, so we don't have to make all this unnecessary speculation about the life based on silicon, the life based on nitrogen, and so on, because there are so many planets in the habitable zones of other stars, just similar to the Earth. So we can we can speculate about life, which is similar to our life. There's a greater probability because we are finding so many other planets, but on the Earth. Now, what about the situation on the Earth? We have very clear evidence that there was life on the Earth when the age of the Earth was practically zero, like 500 million years or so. Now, if you look at your own life, you take oxygen, right? You produce other things. But NASA has um, been able to find that there are certain other species, there are certain like bacterial type things uh, or entire ecologies. They thrive on hydrogen, for example. There are bacteria in our sperm that eat hydrogen. Uh, completely underneath the surface, completely divorced of sunlight. So we don't have to worry about sunlight and uh, uh, and the other things. So here comes my own research a little bit. Um, here is a project that we did um, with a person by the name of Mike Moma at NASA. Uh, he's an expert on methane on, uh, on Mars. Uh, we were looking at the methane flux coming out of Mars. Uh, we know that there is no geological activity on, on Mars, or very little. So there is no way that there could be methane on the atmosphere of Mars, because uh, we calculated this. Let's say we put methane into the Martian atmosphere, 
because of the sunlight, this methane will uh, break uh, into other gases, right? Uh, disintegrate uh, with a time period of about 300 years. But there is a continuous flux of methane on the Mars uh, atmosphere. So we think that there is something funny that I think that there could be a little flux underneath the surface producing this methane because this methane is nothing but a biomarker uh, on the Earth, for example, 99% of methane is produced due to biological light, not due to biological processes. <clears throat> so, but the unfortunate thing is, even if you find life on Mars, you can argue that that light went from here. Or one can argue that life here came from Mars. Why? Because the things in the solar system are not isolated from each other. Uh, they are connected. So it is entirely possible that something could have fallen from Mars and the light landed over here, or vice versa. So what about the interdimensional light? The biologically interdimensional light, in fact, requires a multicellular kind of structure. But we know by looking at the fossil record and so many other things on the Earth that this microbial life, uh, or to multicellular light, the Earth took, or the nature took, quite a lot of time, about 2 billion years or so. So if the life began here on Earth, it is entirely possible that uh, it can begin in the other planets, on the exoplanets. So my thinking is that this is nothing but an absolute possibility. And the best evidence that the life is elsewhere is that the life is here, to me. Now what about the other experiments? There are certain other experiments as well. This is, uh, this is an experiment being planned for the transiting exoplanet service satellites. Um, so the idea is to survey a very large number of uh, stars, about 2 million stars or so, but this time we are going to look for the spectral signature. So what do I mean by this? In fact, this satellite, the capability is such that, let's say there are stars within the first 100 uh, light years or so, that is, uh, that is uh, nearby, uh, 100 light years is not that far, but within that volume, there are so many stars. So we can analyze so many stars, and then we can hope to get the spectrum. But let's say we are looking at some other planet, void of light, and that planet is going around a, a star. We can measure the type of the star. Then we know the atmospheric conditions on that star. Then we know the astronomical um, uh, astronomically it allowed uh, chemicals on that particular planet. But let's say there is life like the Earth, right? So we are over here, we drive, we actually are running the air conditioners, we do so many things to our atmosphere, but this astronomical thing is now changing continuously. So by looking at this spectra, we are hoping that one day uh, we should be able to find this chemical byproducts of life and this is a very ambitious project, and uh, I think it's a very promising project. Now, believe it or not, we have uh, a carbon copy of ourselves, kind of spectral fingerprint. So how do we get this? Now, one of the things is, we can look at the moon, we can look at the earth shine of the moon, and that gives us nothing but the fingerprints of life of the earth. So how do we do this? Like if you look at the look at the trees, for example, we know that the trees absorb light, and the trees re-emit infrared radiation, right? Uh, completely absorb visible and red. That is why the trees are green. Uh, but uh, when you uh, look at the situation, the portion that is going to uh, going to space, you see that there is a slight enhancement of uh, infrared because the trees um, re-emit so much infrared radiation. So we say that there is a kind of a red edge to plant light. This is exactly the case that you see by looking at the moon when you look at the earth shine. And we can point our telescope and take the spectrum and then we have a, a spectral signature of ourselves. And that is a reference line. Now you can also imagine that let's say uh, we don't, uh, let's say there are no humans on the earth. So let's say we look at Young Earth. So if you are looking at a young Earth, then a young, you know, we know that on a young Earth there is methane a rich atmosphere, and we know the spectral signature. Then by looking at the other plants getting the spectrum, we should be able to tell whether 
that is uh, I can uh, okay. so this is the way we do this uh, it's for the transit uh, spectroscopy and here is a star and here is a planet going around and you observe this dip and then we look at this thing very carefully uh, the star and the planet when the planet is just in front of the star we get a spectrum and then we wait until the planet goes to the other side right then we get the stellar spectrum this minus the stellar spectrum should give us the spectrum of the planet and the spectrum has those lines right by looking at these lines uh, we should be able to uh, say so many things in other words if someone is running the air conditioner we should be able to tell this this is not my words in fact um, these are the words that due to uh, John Mather, uh, is a good friend of us, a Nobel Prize winner in cosmology, uh, who is the principal investigator of the James Webb Telescope. This is a very ambitious project that is going to go to space in 2015. Uh, now here is the real size of the, uh, the telescope. This is being built in the United States. Um, and in fact, it's a 6.5 meter uh, uh, mirror right, going into space, and it is capable of detecting carbon dioxide and water and so many other things of the planets uh, going out the other stars. And there is another uh, telescope being planned, it's called Advanced Technology Large Pressure uh, Space Telescope, it's called, uh, yes, uh, and it is a 16 meter segmented telescope and the hope is that we should be able to see about 250 nearby stars, um, especially uh, we should be able to see the planets in the habitable zones. Uh, that is our ambition to detect the light going around the other stars. Now, what are we doing over here? Uh, now, here is a picture that I like very much. This is Galileo in 1610. Uh, he was looking at Jupiter and he was detecting uh, uh, the, the moons going around Jupiter and came to this uh, fundamental. Um, philosophical thing that uh, the Earth is not at the center. And we are detecting the same kind of thing. This is a latest finding, and uh, this is uh, artist drawing, of course. Uh, now, here is a careful observation. A group is the size of the object. It's called UCF. You must have seen this in the newspapers. Uh, it is orbiting another star called this, and it's only 33 light years away. Uh, but um, the astronomers are thinking about this uh, very hard. Uh, why? Because uh, this is uh, a place that, the, uh, that there could be life. Uh, in fact, in order to stack some kind of intelligent life, uh, we think that uh, water is essential, but not only that, land is also essential. Uh, if there is a planet having only water, it is not possible that uh, the creatures would have your uh, fire, rocket engines, and so many other things. So that's why. Uh, we, we think that land is, is necessary, and uh, that land is uh, under you know, investigation. Okay, so to me, life only on Earth is nothing but uh, geocentric. Uh, to make uh, ourselves cosmic, which is indeed the case, we must think that the universe is teeming with life, so there is nothing but some of the promising this coming in So, if you ask me, uh, I myself think that this is entirely possible within my lifetime uh, we should be able to see something interesting. So some of the conclusions, before some other conclusions, um, M-dwarfs are really, really ide um, ideal for planet hunting, especially for the, the, uh, like the planets similar to the Earth. Um, and plus, uh, we are getting pretty interested in this um, scenario, which is called, maybe you have learned this in high school, that uh, there are two theories. One is that uh, when a planet, planetary system forms, uh, it formed like there was a planetary uh, disk in the planetary disk, and some pockets became unstable and collapsed to produce planets. That's one theory. The other theory is that uh, the little things came together to form planets, and they started going around the sun or the other stars. In fact, this study about exoplanets favors this accumulation theory. So if that is the case, 
if I take the earth into account, if you imagine this, the situation about 5 million years ago, and then my latest findings, it's pretty sure that uh, accumulation of little things, the earth came into existence. So if that is the case, earth must have been very hot at the time, about 5 million years ago. And it is very unlikely that the, the primordial water survived on the earth. So if that is the case, then we come into the conclusion that the earth water that I am drinking now and the water in your body was transported to the earth via other things. We have compelling evidence now that uh, it's entirely possible uh, via asteroids the uh, water could have come. So if the light is a cosmic phenomenon, uh, if you pay attention to this so-called space hardy bacteria or space hardy things, uh, then it is entirely possible that light eventually came to us at a later place um, with this water. Now this is a theory that is being investigated very heavily and we have not come to a final conclusion yet, but uh, there is a very strong possibility for this to be the case. Now what about the first inhabited planet finding? Um, I think, uh, including some other people, that this is almost within our grasp and uh, the question is when? I think it is coming uh, very soon. But I think that uh, uh, a talk like this is not really complete without talking about uh, search for extraterrestrial intelligence. Um, so I added a few things. Um, now you must have read about this, it's a very famous study called SETI, but unfortunately there is a lack of detection. And some people are trying to push this to say that there is no life elsewhere. But unfortunately, there are lots of exper uh, experimental limitations to this kind of thing because it's not really, really heavily funded. In fact, uh, we have been able to examine only 750 stars, but each star very briefly in SETI project. But you see that if you want to detect uh, life going around another, uh, on a planet, going around another star, we have to pay attention. We have to look at this planet very carefully for an extended period of time. But all these SETI experiments have not been able to do this. But there is a promising experiment. This is set up in California. It is called Allen Telescope Array. The ambition is to go up to about 350 antennas, but unfortunately due to funds in the situation in the United States, uh, we have been able to put only 42 uh, such things. Uh, it's a pretty simple device. Uh, here is a, a dish, and the radio waves are coming in like this and got reflected to this, this, this uh, area, and then you can uh, take this to a computer. But one of the interesting things is, um, now imagine a civilization, right, that is as bright as us. I'm not claiming that we are a very bright civilization, but let's say they have this, and themselves have figured out that they should be like a Kepler experiment, then they should be looking at us using the transit method. So here is the sun, and here is the earth. When the earth is going in front of us, they should be able to see it. So if that is the case, we need to investigate the direction opposite to the sun very carefully. This is a brilliant idea, and that is being tested using some of these uh, ATA telescopes. But up to now, there hasn't been anything. But here is the latest thing. Uh, here are two telescopes in, uh, in the United States, Keck Telescope. Uh, they have, they are using adaptive optics, so they are not using big uh, mirrors. Instead, they are using these segmented mirrors. But they flash a, a very thick uh, laser into space during an observing run um, to do something else. What they do is that they look at this laser and get the reflected wave, and that is being fed to some other computer to correct for atmospheric turbulences. But the nice thing about this laser is that, imagine that you are being in some other planet, you're looking at this, looking at the Earth, and you're not seeing anything, but you will be able to see this laser, and we can count the intensity of this laser, and the intensity of laser, in fact, outshines the intensity of the sun only momentarily. This is called the looking for flashing lights. So there are people, using big telescopes and small telescopes looking at the cosmos uh, every day, 
every night looking for such flashes, but unfortunately we haven't been able to detect such flashes up to now. So we can say that there are no uh, credible detections at all. It's also an active experiment. Uh, these people are using these telescopes to risk it Okay. Now I think uh, the best way to end this talk is to show this. Um, here is an exoplanet in a typical neighborhood like this. It's entirely possible, um, and the life is also possible. Um, and because the chemistry over here is nothing but the chemistry over there, and we are finding so many planets, we are finding so many big planets, we are finding so many small planets, we are finding planets outside the habitable zones, we are finding planets inside the habitable zones. So the probability for life to exist elsewhere, to me, is very, very large. So I thank you very much, but I think uh, my ambition, uh, my effort will be in vain if you don't ask questions. I like questions, and in fact, when I learned about all these things, I had tons of questions, um, so please ask uh, any questions.